Hello, everyone. Okay. Today, I want to start off with reading you a scripture in Roman chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. So in this very simple sermon, simple uh, scripture, we understand that it is God who gives us this joy and peace. And it is by our trust to him Right, that we may be overflowed by hope. And this hope is by the power of the Holy Spirit. So it's supernatural. It is not like a normal, you know, I feel good, you know, I feel peace. But it's like a supernatural peace. And we understand that in the Bible, the original text, when the Holy Spirit is feeling somebody, it comes from the word playro and pamplami. Pamplami the word was being used every time the Holy Spirit feels somebody and they, they just perform miracles. Supernatural thing happens. But playro is a word that every time that, you know, when somebody is virtual, a supernatural virtue, like they're supposed to be really sad, they're under persecution, but they're peaceful, but they're joyous. You know, it's a supernatural thing. So you can see, actually, in a Christian life, almost everything is somewhat supernatural. We're not like the normal people. You know, you, 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 you punch me and I feel sad. You know, I will be so brave and I will be so joyous and so loving, I can turn my other cheek so you can punch me on the, the other side. You know, so you can see all this virtue is basically supernatural. And right here, without the powers of the Holy Spirit, we basically cannot really have true hope, and we don't have true joy, and we don't have true peace, okay? So it's something that is not by, you don't obtain it by human endeavor, but it's by, you know, from above, by pleasing Him, and He will grant you. You know, actually, I was thinking life is, is a cruel thing, right? Is anybody think that life is a very happy thing? They must be very, you know, not optimistic, they must be really childish or something. Because life is tough. Life, some people say life is like a constant issue. Right? It's like an issue. Some people say life is a job. And when you finish, you know, when you off the job, like getting finished, the day off, I mean, when you get off your job, that means it's time for you to die. Right? <clears throat> so life it is, itself is, a, is full of trouble. And, uh, and we need this heavenly joy, especially for Christians. We need this heavenly joy. And that's why the Sabbath... Uh, it's not just a Sabbath day so everybody take a day off. For the normal people, it's just a Sabbath to take a normal day off. But in Christian, in the Old Testament, <clears throat> Sabbath meaning that I work my sixth day. I try my best on my sixth day. And on the seventh day comes, if I still don't get enough money, if my, my dream did not come true, or I still have to continue to fight my war or whatever, I stop. Instead of finishing it, or trying to complete it on the seventh day, what we do? Christian all stops and let God take over. So basically, Sabbath is a proclamation from the Israelites to the Gentile, to the whole world saying that I, Israelites, have a God that is so mighty that once I finish my part on the sixth day, even any lacking, anything that I cannot, any problem I cannot solve, my God is going to take care of me. So you don't work on the Sabbath day, you know. And you have to come to Him, you know, come to His court in a spirit of thanksgiving, a spirit of joy. So you really don't want to come to God on a Sunday and feel very, very sad, you know. And you have to come to Him in this kind of joyous mode, not because your days is good, not because you're, you have a very, uh, you know, terrific week. So a lot of good things happen, so you come here happy. You come here happy, because this is the time that you're honoring Him, that knowing Him, putting a trust in Him, knowing that in Sabbath is a promise of God that He will take care of us. 
So Christians have no real worry because God Almighty is with us. And then he said that if it's not his permission, not one strand of hair will be fallen onto the ground. In the original text, that one strand of hair it means every hair has a serial number. Every single hair is numbered. So if it's not his permission, not a single strand of hair will fall. So think of it this way. Do you think anything that happened in your week is a coincidence? Good thing or bad things? If not one strand of hair will be fallen without his permission, you think you can have somebody break into your car? You think you can all of a sudden find a new good boyfriend? Or all of a sudden your husband is being mean to you? Or all of a sudden your job, you're, 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 you're being fired? and all of a sudden your boss you know, promote you, you think all those things will just happen if not one strand of hair will fall in without his permission. You really have to think about this. This is talking about the Reformed theology. They really uphold that, 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 that sovereignty of God. He is all in all. He is not controlling, but he is overseeing. He is running. He is orchestrating every single thing in your life. To the point, even if one strand of hair that falls, you know, sometimes you wash your hair, there's some kind of hair falls down under the sink, right? And sometimes three, sometimes four, which is normal. And you can see, okay, today God said there are four hairs. It won't be five. It won't be three. Because every single hair that drops, you know, it, it kind of shows you how he is in charge of your life. So Sabbath is a reminder to us, not to him, you know, he set Sabbath as an unconditional law. You know, in, in, the, in the Bible, there's all kinds of law. Because law is, is set up in a way, so if something happened, then it would be like this. But what if this person is this? Then it would be like this. You know, that's if, you know, that if all and but. Law is not that rigid, right? Right? The, okay, if you are, uh, oh, I'm going to get into it. But when unconditional law means there's no if, or, and but. And Sabbath was in one of the unconditional law. So when you come to church on Sunday, it is really not, you know, not up to your liking. It is your proclamation to the world or to the spiritual realm that you are the children of God. You don't have to come to church. Because if you don't come to church, I'm not saying you have to come to this church, but if you don't go to church, it's basically your proclamation to the world saying that I am not children of God. That's why I don't have to follow the law of God. Of course you don't have to follow, right? You're not a children of God, why do you need to come to church? Coming to church is an unconditional law and the commandment of God. Right? So it's a very serious stuff. I want you guys to understand how serious the law is because it will haunt you. And God promised if you don't come to Sunday, go read uh, Deuteronomy chapter 28. This is the whole list of curse that's going to come upon you when you break His law. But if you come to church on Sunday and you proclaim to Him, it's a statement that you're making that I come to church because I'm a children of God then the whole bunch of blessing on the same chapter, Deuteronomy chapter 28, is going to fall on you. So that's why following the law is a very, very important thing. And a lot of things we, you know, in this kind of culture, I mean, everything is so liberal, everybody's talking about right, and you feel like, you know, if I'm tired, I don't to do this. You know, if you are tired, you still have to do this. You know, on the Old Testament, for some whatever reason it is, if you start working on Sunday, they will stone you to death. It's death penalty. If you break the Sabbath law, you know, it's a death penalty. Why is it so serious? Because it's a proclamation to the world and to the spiritual realm that are you a Christian or not? And then if you proclaim you're not a Christian, that we all treat you differently. And actually, the important thing is God will treat you differently and all the angels will not be friendly to you. And all the demonic power, the dark side, 
will be happy because you're going to hell with them. You know, and they will be playing you. So it's a very serious thing about the law of God. So when God said, come to my court with a heart of thanksgiving, it doesn't mean that you have a very happy week. You could have a horrible week, but you still have to come to him with a heart of thanksgiving because at least as a Christian, he saved you from hell. Okay, so we have to kind of understand this. And uh, I started to notice, you know, because, uh, you know, our, our blazing star, right now God is rising us up. Uh, last week we went to D.C. and there's more than over 100 people coming to us from cancer end stage and a lot of, you know, kids coming in with all this tube hanging to him. Two years old, is about to die, and, and the Papa Mama was really have lost hope. And they come to us, a lot of people, some, some are on the wheelchair, they can't even walk. And actually, majority of people of them are end state, end state, like when the doctor said, you're about to die. So they all come, and I told them that, uh, you know, three days, one week, two weeks, you know, one month. And because this one week's passed, so now all these testimonies coming in that people are getting better and get better and, you know, and, and healing. So basically, we are re God is really rising up as a full-blown ministry now. And, uh, 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 we're talking about how to promote this in the future and how can Washington, D.C. help us, you know, coordinate and we're just going to do all this stuff. So with all this supernatural power coming upon us, you know, our spiritual Kung Fu is very important. And one of the spiritual basic, you know, fundamental spiritual things that you need to do is to know how to be self-denying carrying the cross. Because if that is not good, you're going to have a hard time. You're going to have a dangerous time, not a hard time, because we're all loving here. You're going to have a dangerous time in Blazing Star. You know how the mystical master and they are they practicing everything is to slow down the powers of the soul. Let's imagine this. Imagine this. If the powers of the spirit is moving this way, and the powers of the soul is moving this way, right? So it kind of cancel each other. But you want the power of the Holy Spirit, you know, in the spirit to move good and spin in powerful way, then your soul, your soulish, you know, thing have to come in, come into heart, and then your spirit will spin fast. There are no ministry of Christ that can perform great miracles if they are very soulish is that a word? It's not a word. Uh, I mean, if his soul one uh, is is not being dealt with, so that's why, you know, Saint John the Cross wrote something like a dark, the dark nights of the soul. You guys should read that book. It's very scary. It's talking about how God want to deal with you, to give you this this major cross experience, right? Yeah, like 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 a uh, Nancy. Before she joined Blazing Star, she was a happy camper. Everything is just like, cool. But once she joined Blazing Star, God is shoving something to her in her life. Then she starts starting to, you know, thinking like, wow, this is like entering into a dark tunnel or something, right? And, and you too, right? Before you enter into Blazing Star, is, life is a little bit better. But after you run into Blazing Star, life gets much tougher. Even though right now you're not a blazing star, but the cross has already started. It's a process that God is already starting. So it's important. It is important because we are so easygoing. We're so fun-loving. We're not like those traditional church. But it comes to play that, you know, this traditional church thing is, is still important. And because you see all this, uh, like uh, Priscilla, all this leadership, uh, like Wings and Crystal, they have went through hell. Their life has literally been dragged through hell for years. So somehow they, they have what, completed the causes of the cross, like completed the causes of, broken, of brokenness, right? So their soul, their soul will be more submitting to the spirit. You know how you can tell you're not a very spiritual person? Because when the Lord wants you to be happy, 
you feel sad. And there's no way you can flip that switch because that soulish power inside you is driving you to be down. And even the Lord say, give you all this good news, you should be up. You just cannot dry up because your emotion is not led by the Holy Spirit, but is led by your own flesh. Right? That's why if you want to be a good Blazing Star uh, member, you have to have that switch in, in your emotion. You have to have absolutely full control of your emotion. And you have to have absolutely full control of your desire. And the spirit side is, is another thing. Because we may not say anything, but if it's serious moment, if it's war time, if it's some moment that you need to focus, and we're going to drop that, and you just cannot linger on. You cannot linger on. You will just drop it, and it's like never happened. Nothing matters. Now, this is called kingdom spirit. It's like everything in us, our emotion, our desire, everything is led by the Holy Spirit. And I know it's tough. You cannot do it in one day. It takes years of like uh, molding and breaking, you know, molding, molding and breaking, you know, in your life. So look at this. In Jeremiah chapter 48, verse 11, Moab has been arrest, at rest from youth like wine left on its dregs, not poured from one jar to another. She has not gone into exile, so she tastes as she did, and her aroma is unchanged. Which is, you know how to get a nice wine? It's like you settle it for a while, and then you pour it onto the new jar, right? So you take away the impurity. And after you settle, you'll pour it again, right? Until you keep pouring it until the final product is very, very pure. Then you save that, right? This, this is a process of making wine. And what happened is Moab is somebody that God doesn't like. They don't like this, this group of people. So God kind of cursed this group of people. And they use this group of people always just to do some kind of problem to give uh, Israel problem, you know, to fight Israel. It's just to train Israel. The purpose is for Israel. And at the end, God is going to put all Moab Moab people into hell. So the Moab, uh, when they're young, God doesn't want to deal with them. So they are like wine sitting there pretty, you know. Nobody moves them. So he's very, very happy because nobody is giving him trouble. Nobody is really picking on him. You know, sometimes little kids, there are people bullying you. And the parents will be, oh, yeah, somebody's bullying my kid. Let them be. Let the whole world bully them. Because when they feel the world is, is a cruel place, they will come to God. When I was a little kid, my, my life is really, really bad. You know, I'm a person, one of the persons I can say life sucks. And, you know, I have no joy to go play with anybody. I have no friends because I've been moving around so fast, so many times. I have, I don't, I don't even have a home to go to. You know, I'm not living with my father and mother. I'm living in a little corner of a shelf, locked up in a place for years. I don't go to school. I cannot go to school. I'm locking up in a place that I climb up there, and during meal time, I just climb down there and eat with my, you know, some of the people taking care of me, because my dad and mom is, is, is like trying to possess, take away us from each other. So my dad took me. He will hide me in somewhere in the corner of a room. I can't even stand up. It's like a three feet high and a five feet wide, you know, just enough for me to lay down. And I was in that kind of closet where no movie, nobody teach me anything. I cannot go to school. I cannot go to church. I cannot go to McDonald's, you know, for years. That's my childhood. And that's not the worst part. But with all that situation, what, what it pushed me is like I, I become like a spiritual person. I know this world has no hope. This is a hopeless world. This world has lost its glory. And I want to find something in Him. I'm seeking on the spiritual thing. That's why I always pray. And when I have a chance, when all these people are going to play soccer and people playing basketball, I'm the guy that hides in my own room and I pray. I pray so hard that all the sofa is all wet. And sometimes I'm grabbing onto that wall, you know, and I pray so hard that so the whole thing is, is moist with my with my tears. The good thing is because it's salty, so it won't mold. <laughs> but sometimes it's good, you know. Of course, I'm not saying that, okay, parents, 
give your kids some pressure. Because yesterday, it was yesterday, we are eating in that new place, Wang, Wang Dai Tong, you know. It was pretty good, actually. So we're up there on the second floor, and then there was this father and mother. There was a six years old kid sitting right there. And both of the father and mother was teaching the kids. And the mom would say, come on, come on, yeah, 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 yeah. And then the father would say, yeah, yeah, come on, come on, come on. And there's just one statement here, one statement there, together. They were talking so loud. You know, it's like filling up the whole place. Everybody hears it. And the kid was sitting there, very scared because it's a little tiny kid. It's like six, six, seven years old. And the father and mother was like giving him a hard time. Hey, you're not sitting up right. You know, why have to feed you? You're not listening to me. You know, forget about going to school. You're going to flunk anyway. And it was like giving, you know, all this kind of hard time. And the kid was sitting there through his judgment period, like judgment day. And I was thinking, gee, you know, this is like ridiculous. But this is not how God is going to treat you or raise you. You know why? Because your parents, you're lucky that your parents are godly people. And your parents, believe it or not, is ruled by God, is ruled by church, is ruled by the Word of God. So we are all God's people and God have His own dealing with you. So if you don't like your life, if you come, want to complain this, you want to complain that, complain to God. Because He's the one that's doing it. It's not your dad and mom. Your dad and mom already try their best. You know, some of us doesn't have good parents, right? Don't want to say, speak up. Yes. Some of us doesn't have good parents. Horrible parents. But it's not your parents. It's God. It is God who set that kind of parents to, to raise you. And you can still learn from it. Right? So if you have a bad childhood, don't blame the parents. I mean, I never blame my parents. Because I know even they are under the control of God. They can't help themselves. Nobody can help themselves. Everything is in Christ all in all, that He is the one that provides all the breaking, and He chooses those that He loves. And those that seek Him, those that are Christians, He will give them a cross. And that cross which is going to break you for good. Why? Because at its break, breaking you, your soulish power, supposedly, will cease and come to a halt. And then the anointing comes, and you will spin in spirit power. It's a great thing. We're having a ball here. You know, when we, when we go to ministry, when we go out, and you can feel that power, you know, and it's just so enjoyable. It's exciting. You know, you know how exciting it is when you lay hand on somebody that is end-state cancer and they can heal? They can't be healed. Unless it's kind of rush, you don't get anywhere else. It's better than any kind of movie you can watch. You know, it's like, a, it's like a priceless experience. I mean, I wish that you guys can have that experience. And it's not that hard to have that experience because this is the millennium God is going to outpour His Spirit to everyone. But your soulish force has to come to a halt so that, you know, the spirit force can go, can move. And this morning I was thinking about Corey. I mean, the Holy Spirit was telling me how much, God was telling me how much He loved Corey. And they keep saying, she's the oracle. Even though right now she rejected that, or she thinks she's not, or she kind of buries it, she is an oracle. And you know what is in store for oracle? I cannot tell you, it's secret. <laughs> it's like, it's amazing things in the world that when the Holy Spirit power comes down, but it will not function right if you have so much of your own flesh. And that flesh can only be dealt with by the cross. So you see, Romans chapter 15, 13, we will talk about the hope and the peace and joy. In Psalms 45, verse 7, you love righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore God, your God, has set you above your companions by anointing you with the oil of joy. And this is what God said to Christ. Because Christ is so good. God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to set you apart. I'm going to anoint you more than anybody else with what? Oil of joy. Do you know that, what that means? 
It means like anointing, anointing oil, not just the oil that you use in the kitchen. But the anointing of joy is the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what anointing means, power of the Holy Spirit. It is something that is supernatural. It will carry you through all kinds of trouble in your life and allow you to focus on kingdoms, allow you to focus on Christ. Nothing can sway you, nothing can shake you because you are shaped upon you. You know, your bank accounts, you got bankrupt, you, you flung the test, you flung your finals, you cannot find a spouse, you know, your husband is not good, your kid is not good, you know, whatever happened, it doesn't matter because something is so great, it overshadows all and that is called the oil of joy. That's why Christ can endure so much suffering. Of course, he is Christ, and he is very cool, right? But because he was anointed with the oil of joy. You know, sometimes we feel down, we feel frustrated. It's okay. It's okay to be feel down and frustrated, but only for a little while. Now, if you feel down more than a day, then something is wrong with your spiritual life. You're not healthy. That's a very, very easy gauge to see are you healthy in the spirit. You know, it's the joy. You, know, you don't want to let, let things take away your joy and peace because God is the one that provides that you shall not lack. Because God is the one that protects you. Because God is your Savior. He is your God. He will, He's your Heavenly Father. Why you fear so much? Everything that happens on earth is only like a play. That's what Paul said. It's like a movie. You know, we're playing through the script for the angel and for the people to watch. It's already set. It's already set. So you're going through it. No matter what comes in your way, no matter what you're facing, you have to remember one thing, that God is my God. Right? Unless he died, then I would cry. But if he's not dead, he's still alive, he is in control of everything. You know, I have sometimes I have issue that I really, really worry, you know, like in Hong Kong and all this kind of stuff. But I was thinking about why I worry. First of all, I didn't make any mistake. I follow to your word. I do everything that I, I want, you know, that you want me to do. And this whole thing is set up in your own hand. So why worry? It's yours. Right? It's God. So Martin too, right? There's so many things in life that we will worry. I mean, if God wanted to go through, it will go through. If God wanted to never go through, it will never go through. So it's all in Him. So the best thing to do is to please Him. And he will mix it right for you. And this is what he said. All the thought that he has for us is good thought. It's for you to have joy and peace. Now, if you're not walking in his will, then that maybe you should worry. Even though everything's go rosy, you still should worry. Because if you're not in his will, it will come to you. A curse will come to you. But if you're in his will, then why we worry? And that's what Sabbath means. Every, every seventh day, we'll remind ourselves, actually, God wants want us to remember that He is in charge. If you have a problem you can't solve, don't worry, Sabbath. The meaning of Sabbath is He is in charge. He will make it right. right? I guess I have a lot of problems too, right? Financial, all kinds of problems. I see it. I, I pray for you every day and I know how hard it is. And I was saying to the Lord, I can't even help her. Actually, nobody can help you. And I'm very certain I was saying to God, but you can. Now, when you come and help, everything is going to be fine. And this is something that God always wants us to learn, as a children to learn. So how you please Him? By following His Word. So every Sunday you're coming over here is to learn a little bit more about the Word of God. Because David said, I, I really want to keep your Word in my heart because I don't want to wrong you. Because if you don't have enough word of God, you may wrong God and you did not know, and that's why your life sucks so bad. Seriously, I think we are we're making it. We're hitting the jackpot already. We have so much health power. I can purge, I can be worse in time. You know, we can heal people, we can perform miracles. I mean the life is like really back to the old, the old, old first century church. And it's so exciting. And then I was, I was praising God, praising God, and I was thinking, Lord, 
I'm so glad during my last 40 some years or 50 some years that you really break me good. So up to this point, you know, I may be like, like laughing and joking, but if it comes down to it, Chalasan will not dare to go against his will. I, it's just not in me, because I know how much he's in charge. And that, you know, is really serious about dealing with your emotion. And, and sometimes, you know, life is totally tough. It's a very, very tough thing. It's a cruel world, right? And without God, it's even worse. With God, we will have this hope. So, James chapter 1, verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. When you face trials of many kinds, consider it pure joy. Mm, so weird. It has to be supernatural. It's impossible. If you're sick, if you're dying, if you're bankrupting, if you have financial problem, if you have health problem, if you have job problem, consider pure joy. Yep. That's why the Bible said, this joy is by the powers of the Holy Spirit. And then Philipp Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, Rejoice in the Lord always, I will say it again, rejoice. The whole book of Philippians is talking about joy. But I just want to sum it up. Joy is a command. Because the word, you know, the, the original text in this phrase, he's not saying you try to be happy. He's telling you, you have to rejoice. And I say it again, you know, in the, in the, in the Hebrew time and in the, in the, in the Greek time, when they say it again, it means it's very serious. So Paul is saying you have to rejoice. At least for one thing, because God saved you, from hell. We know that one day when we make, meet our maker, you know, we are gonna we are gonna be fine, right? You know that, right? At least the point, right? Why you should be happy? Because your name, I seen you, your name is written in the book of life. So that is really amazing. Now if you if anybody's name is not in the book of life, then you really should worry. It doesn't matter how happy you are now, because eventually you will go to hell. And that's not good. But when the day comes when we really pass away, you know, God opened up this book of life. I say, oh, Priscilla, welcome. No. Just for that, you should not be so worrisome. Just for that, you should be happy. And this is called the joy of salvation. It's like music around, surrounding us. Okay? So it's very important because when you're not happy, you're sending a signal to God. Saying that, Lord, I don't think you're a good God. You're my father. You didn't give me nothing. It's basically like that. Mm -hmm. So, and God is really an amazing father. You know, if you nag on him, the more you nag on him, he won't give you. But when you start praising him, you say, Lord, you're good. You can take it away. You can give it. Just like Job. You're still good. You know, no matter what you do, you're good. You're always good. And then when you praise him like that, you're pleasing him. And then all the blessing of heavenly blessing will come upon you. I mean, it's a very simple one and two thing. You can, you can talk for like a whole conference, but basically come down to it. This joy is something that we must have. And also when we look at cross and we look at difficulties in life, we have to understand this is the hands of God breaking you so that your being will be able to reveal his glory. And that's how he feels you. This is how it goes. In Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, we talked about this scripture two weeks ago. And provide for those who grieve in Zion to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes. Wow, good. Instead of ashes, I have a crown of, of, of beauty. The oil of joy instead of mourning. Great, right? No, you don't have to cry anymore. The oil of joy is coming down. And a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Wow, that's so darn good. And they will be called oaks of righteousness. The oaks are in Oakland. 
Seriously. That's why Oakland called Oakland, because we have a lot of oaks here. You know what's the special thing about oak tree and other tree? When you look at other trees, you know, you can see a big tree and the root is down there. It's not the symmetrical, but oak tree is the only, is the only tree that the top, you know, what you see on top is the symmetrical on the bottom. So if you see an oak tree like this, the root is like this. If you see an oak tree like this, the root is like this. That's just cool, huh? So they will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Now, all this is good, and we are hitting in the millennium, and all this thing is happening. The point, the key point is, and provide for those who grieve in Zion. And where is Zion? Zion is the, the greatest uh, uh, capitals of, of God, it's people. People of Zion are those who, who constantly seek after God, seek after His Word and want to please God. Then you consider Zion, like basically true children of God. All of this good stuff will not apply to you if you are not a member or a person of science. So who are the people in science? What classify you as a Christian? Because Christians are those who are following the commandments of God. And we are His children, and He will protect us. And that's why we go to Sabbath. Because not because we, we have nothing to do. We are very busy people, you know. I don't think anybody would be so not, have nothing to do on Sunday. So might as well go to church, you know. It's not an enjoyable thing. Actually, do you, you feel things, think, thinking Sunday is very enjoyable? Yeah, see? See, he's being honest. <laughs> it's not about enjoyable, but we come here because God set it as an unconditional law. And we learn about his word so we would, not, we would know not to cross the line, right? The more things you learn, the better, merrier. Because sometimes you, you, just, uh, you just don't know. People think, they, oh, I have a good reason to be depressed. And they're depressed for three days, for four days, like spiraling down, like, oh, like so sad. You know, all those people are darn right loser. I'm not even speaking spiritual. I'm speaking in, in secular terms. A true man, a real man, when you are being suppressed down, you know, you stand up. So the Bible said the righteous has fall down seven times, but they stand up seven times. The seven is only a number talking about the perfection of his fallen. So a righteous person is not because he's always standing. He's always the last man standing. He never fall. No, he falls, but he always stand back up. That is a righteous man. And what, you know what is the definition of a righteous man? I'll give you some theology tests. What is the definition of righteous man? <laughs> a righteous man are those who God pleases. You know? If God likes you, you're a righteous man. If God doesn't like you, then you're not a righteous man. And what makes God like you? Anybody know? What makes God like you? For those who keep my commandment are those who love me. And those who love me, I will love them. Right? This is what Jesus said. So, the commandment of God is important. And today, we learn at least one commandment. A commandment that we always lack to understand the significance of it. And what is that? is to be joyous in Christ. Yep. We cannot do it ourselves, but rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. It doesn't matter what kind of situation you're in. You have to have that joy because true praise, praise has to be a happy moment, right? Like true peace. No. True joy has to be peaceful. 
if you're not so peaceful, you cannot be really happy. And if you're not happy, you really cannot praise God, right? So all this praise, all this joy is all grabbed in one thing. It's a spirit of thanksgiving that God, you are good God. And whatever is given to me, whatever dish to me in life, I will face it with a positive attitude because I know you stand by me and I know you're my God. And that's the faith. Okay, let me read through this whole thing. La lastly, in 1 Peter chapter 1, 6 to 8, In all this you greatly rejoice. So now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. And those are not little trials. They are persecuting them. They're killing them. So this, this is the trial they're going through, okay? This have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith of greater worth than gold, which perish even though refined by fire, may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. So you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. Hmm. That's where we stand now. I'm more than happy. Inexpressible. I don't even know what to do. Should I dance or should I sing? I don't know. I cannot express it. But this joy is like powers in me. The joy is like a strength in me. And I feel like I'm very healthy in the spiritual realm. I'm healthy in this walk. And in this joy, I know that He loves me and because I know that I have pleased Him. So brother and sister, strive on, okay? Be a good kid. Submit under to your parents because otherwise God will not like you. You'll be end up like Moab. God will just set you aside and let you just rot and die and what eternal hell is waiting for you. This is what Moab was, Moab was doing. Just leave you sitting there pretty. Nobody touches you. Nobody tells you what to do. You just do whatever you want. And your, your aroma will never change. Your aroma of darkness, your aroma of fresh and evil will never change. But if you submit under the molding and the breaking of God, pretty soon God is going to fill you with His joy. And He's going to pour down on you this oil of joy from heaven. It's priceless. Okay? Simple lesson. Not so easy to do because it has something to do with your emotion. Joy is something that is your emotion. I'm not just saying that you should just put up that fixed joker smile. But, you know, you need to have that emotion switch around and understanding that He is in charge. Okay, let us pray. Heavenly Father, you are so awesome. I so wish I can lead all these youngsters to your throne and just look at how wonderful you are in your kingdom, how glorious it is in your kingdom. And your kingdom is upon earth. It is not coming. It is here. It is in our life. It is in our miracle that we perform. It is in our healings. It is in every single step we took and every revelation that we receive, and every visitation of angel, angelic and the divine. Lord, this supernatural dimension is so powerful and exciting and filled with the heavenly splendor. But Lord, today teach us through your word how to receive it. Receive it with the heart of thanksgiving. Keep pressing in with the heart of thanksgiving and a joy a joy that is not based on our circumstances that we're in, but a joy that is based on the trust that you are our God. And you are our God and we are your children. Lord, give us this. Give this to us. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.